or not. Meeting. Um, I would go around the table and ask everybody to introduce themselves, but that that takes up time. And I think we probably uh, all know each other. Um, I can't see any new names uh, on the list. Otherwise, I would have uh, picked upon you. Oh, I do see a new name now, and I'm going to pick on you, Deb Hallett. I believe you're at New Southgate Surgery. Would I be correct? Sorry, I was just trying to find my unmute button and I'm desperately trying to find my video button. I don't use Zoom very often. No, really. <laughs> yeah. No, um, yes, I am at New Southgate Surgery. Um, yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> 
are you one of ours? <laughs> excellent, excellent, yeah. I'm a GP. Yeah. yeah, sorry. GP there, 25 years this year. Yeah, I've probably seen you about one or two ailments, but we'll not go into that. We'll not go into that. <laughs> not um, on the Zoom, no. <laughs> no, not on the Zoom. Can you just look at my elbow? No, anyway. No. <laughs> so lovely, lovely. Welcome to the meeting and, and, mm -hmm. and, and thank you. Um, so, okay. As I say, uh, I hope you're all keeping well. Um, we've got some really good items on our agenda today. We are going to be succinct. Uh, we are on Zoom. It is a shame, but we are where we are. If I could just say to you that I can't get everybody on this screen. If it is that you've anything to say, then uh, stick your hand up. Uh, I think there is an, a mechanical hand somewhere there. Uh, I'm sure Ruth will keep an eye open if, if I miss anybody. Uh, and if you have any comments, then just put it in the chat box and I will pick it up um, once we have uh, a, a break in the proceedings. So uh, thank you uh, again and welcome. First of all, can we have uh, apologies for absence, please? Any apologies? Yes, Chair. I've got Melanie Brown, Linda Harris, Andrew Bolchin, Beati Wagner and Councillor Ferguson. Lovely. Thank you. Um, any further apologies that we haven't mentioned anybody? Okay, thank you. Then we'll move on to the next item on the agenda, which is the minutes of the meeting uh, held on the 18th of November. I'm sure you've all read them. We'll go through them page by page. Uh, page one, are there any matters arising on page one? Page two, uh, I have Anna. We talked about the big conversation at the last meeting. It's not on the agenda at the moment. Is there any uh, any update that you can give us? Um, yes, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Maureen. So we have nearly 100 um, big conversationalists. I've just left a, a full day's um, preparation for running the training, um, which is going to start in March. We've appointed a communication company, One to One Development, who I know is a very well-known local um, company in Wakefield. So they're starting um, to do the comms in a, in a few weeks' time, and they've worked up the concept. Um, we, we're well on the way with the plans. Um, we've got an, we've recruited an OD post, so we've we've uh, we've now got an, an organisational development plan, um, and we're starting. We've started the newsletter, which comes out um, once a week. Which if you if you don't get that, please do send me your email, and we're we're open to sort of anyone getting that. Um, that's been very well received, um, and we're also um, we're also starting mentoring groups um, over the next couple of weeks with the conversation list. So so far it is it's going very well, um, and we're really really looking forward to starting the the face to face training at the beginning of March. Yeah, I think we're all well. I'm certainly looking forward to that because I think I'm one of your volunteers, and I do receive the uh, the newsletter. So I'm sure that if you don't receive the newsletter from Anna, uh, if you could uh, if you could let um, uh, I don't know who's administering this meeting. I'm sorry, is it you, Heather? I can't see you. Who is it that's doing it? Anyway, if you could let... Yeah, it's. Um, I am helping today, but it's Catherine and Gemma. Oh, right. If you can let Catherine know who's on the call, uh, then I'm sure we can get it uh, get it out to you. So thank you for that, uh, uh, for that update. And uh, any further matters arising on page two? Page three, uh, the resident recovery benefits campaign. We're getting some really, really good feedback on that. And I know it is uh, resident recovery today uh, and that feedback will be shared with uh, members there. Uh, but I would like to invite Simon to the next meeting to share that data with us all uh, and the plans for the uh, next campaign. So anything else on page three? On page four, page five, uh, Ruth, has anybody submitted any comments uh, other than the overview and scrutiny and the conversation that you and I have had and the, oh, hello, Joe, and the the comments that Joe has sent in. Nice to have you back. No, just uh, overview and scrutiny. And, and as you said, Joe has, has commented on it, yeah. That's all. Lovely. I think we uh, and we will discuss that on the agenda. I think it's I think we're coming up with a, a, a really good document um, and I think it's been a good all round effort. So uh, any matters arising on I've forgotten the page number six. And finally, page oh, seven and eight. 
Nobody. Are we happy to approve those meeting those minutes? Just I'll do that if you are. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, Chair's announcements. I've just got two announcements uh, to make, and I will bring Anna in. But uh, uh, we are aware that the uh, child obesity um, figures have been released, and 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 sadly, uh, Wakefield don't look too good there. Uh, but we did submit lots and lots of data, so maybe that was our downfall. And other councils maybe didn't. But I will ask Anna to actually give us a presentation at the next, not today, but at the next meeting. I just wondered if you had a couple of words you'd like to say, Anna. Yeah, I mean, I think it's that it won't come as any surprise to the Health and Wellbeing Board to understand that um, children have put on weight during the pandemic. Um, this data is actually the whole of last year's um, data. So um, obviously things may well have changed since children started going back to school. I mean, I think if we're going to take the positives from it, um, firstly, we were one of very few local areas nationally that actually managed to get enough data to be able to then it be provided back at a local level. And we've then done some in-house sort of data cleansing to make sure that it's accurate and it is. Um, the other thing is it's obviously indicative of the fact that when our service, when children are in our services, so when they are in schools or, um, you know, other settings for children, it actually has a really, really positive effect on, on maintaining a healthy weight. Um, because prior to the pandemic that our, our, the children's, although it was always too, you know, it was harder than we'd have liked, we had, we had, it had remained stable. Um, so there's significant amounts of work going on in the district um, around children maintaining a healthy weight and that ranges from um, interventions in pregnancy to um, very sort of things around wider determinants, health, at, you know, um, uh, hungry holiday clubs, etc. Um, so we will come back to the Next Health and Wellbeing Board with a much more um, detailed um, presentation. Uh, I think, you know, just, just be mindful, we may, it, this may be covered, um, that we may get some press on this, and um, partly because Wakefield were one of the very few areas that actually had, had the data uh, that were able to collect the, the quality data. Um, but um, we, we hope that the next lot of um, child measurement programme da data will, will show an improvement. That's lovely. Thanks for thanks for the update, and we look forward to hearing more about it and the initiatives in place. Because I know we were booking the trend prior to the uh, to COVID hitting us, uh, and as you say, more people have been stuck at home and comfort eating and so on and so forth. But I know there's lots of initiatives out there uh, for families and 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 support for uh, particular areas, and we look forward to an update uh, on that at the next meeting. Joe, you want to come in? Yeah, and um, I mean, obviously, I've seen the figures and they are um, quite stark in relation to the impact that COVID's had on the child obesity. But I suppose the conversation Anna and I was having um, earlier today was the whole impact on health and well-being and the real um, sort of granular level of detail that we need to understand as a health and well-being board in relation to that impact because this has caught us a little bit left field in terms of the profound gap that we now have compared to previous so in an in an and we're going to talk to you separately Ma, uh, Maureen about this and take this through the place-based committee but um, we're considering maybe getting a more in-depth insight into the impact on um, health and well-being um, um, as a result of of the of the of COVID um, over the next sort of six months to 12 months and doing something ourselves that's over and above some of the national surveys um, and the other pieces of intelligence that we work, uh, have relied on in the past. So we're gonna, we're gonna work um, with Anna to pull up a proposal and then maybe fetch that back to yourself um, and start to get some more in-depth surveys so that we can be a little bit on the forward foot um, about what we're actually potentially dealing with here. Lovely, thank you, thank you, uh, Joe. We look forward to uh, positive steps forward to 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 challenge this uh, at the next meeting, uh, Anna, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, the second thing I wanted to raise was um, for me since I went to the West Yorkshire Health and Wellbeing Board chairs meeting yesterday, uh, which was qu quite good. Um, it's I think it's the first one I've been to, or it might be the second. Uh, and with a couple of really good presentations, an introduction uh, from uh, Cathy Elliott, who's the new chair of the uh, of the board, a presentation from Rob Webster about the state of uh, the hospitals at the moment, uh, which we know, I mean, we know from Anna's figures and figures from our CCG colleagues uh, that um, 
uh, things are on the, uh, the decrease, but sadly on the increase in schools and there's a big pressure on mental, mental health beds. Uh, and I think the other problem that was raised was around the uh, vaccination for the 17 to 29 year olds, uh, which are running quite low at the moment. Uh, and of course, we had um, the update on the ICBs and congratulations to Jo. I don't know where she's gone, uh, who's, who, who will now move over to the ICB. Um, and I think that was about it. Um, yep, that was about it for that. So, uh, so that's just a couple of things I wanted to actually mention. Um, the next item is uh, urgent items. I have no urgent items to raise. Uh, members' declarations of interest, if anybody has any declaration of interest on anything on the agenda, whether it be pecuniary or personal, then please let Catherine know and complete the uh, relevant form. I think the next item is public questions. I'm not sure we've got any members of the public here, uh, but if we have and they have a question, I'm more than happy to actually listen to what that question is or uh, is it just something that they've come to listen to on the agenda? But I don't think we've any. Catherine, can you? Uh, do you know if we have any members of the public here? Not that I know of, Chair. Thank you. So we'll move on. Um, action log, Ruth. Over Thank to you. you. So you'll see that we've um, Gemma's done a really good job sort of cleaning up the action log. Um, we've greyed out those things that are now completed but we're still open at the last meeting and then the the three other actions that are on there are all due to come back onto the agenda for the next meeting so there's nothing outstanding in that respect thank you okay thank you ruth has anybody anybody any questions on the action log are we missing anything are we taking something off we shouldn't talk to have done okay i can't see any indication hey we're going to be done by half past two um Okay, over to you again then. Oh no, just a minute, let me have a look. Oh Mark, it's you that's next. Welcome Mark. I've seen your presentation. I didn't, I'm hoping you're going to explain it to me because I'm, I'm not sure I understood it, but but um, are you presenting on screen, uh, Mark? Yeah, I am Maureen. I think, yeah, Gemma's just sharing it now. So uh, uh, yeah, if you just, uh, yeah, good stuff. Can everybody see that okay? I'll, I'll take yeah. silence as acceptance. So uh, um, right, yeah, I'll I'll, uh, I'll I'll whip through this uh, presentation and we can have a bit of a discussion about it if that's helpful, Maureen. I'll do my best to kind of explain some of it as best I can. Uh, but it's uh, it's kind of evolving piece of work at the moment. So um, a, um, a number of months ago now, uh, cabinet took a decision to um, start a piece of work to look at how as a district, we could start to move towards measuring success in a different way. So, you know, rather than focusing on economic development, economic growth being kind of our main objective, one of our main objectives as an authority, actually looking broader than that now and recognising that um, endless economic development, um, as we've seen for decades now, is not necessarily resulting in the kind of... Um, equality in society that we actually want to see. So these um, uh, emerging work at the moment around economic well-being and what that actually means for areas like Wakefield, but also um, there's a lot of discussion going on at national level as well about um, whether well-being is a more accurate um, and representative measure of the success of, uh, of an economy. So it can you just move on, Gemma. So I think, you know, this kind of quote sums it up really, where, you know, for, for decades, you know, governments have been focusing on generating wealth and boosting um, GDP as, as the principal measure of economic growth, as if that kind of endless striving towards economic growth should be the end destination. That should be the thing we continue to strive for. And, you know, as a, as a British economy and as a European economy and as a global economy, we've got quite good at it. You know, globally, we generate on an annual basis $400 trillion worth in global wealth. And that equates to about $70,000 per person of, for everybody living in the world right now. But I think it's fair to say um, not everybody benefits in the world uh, from £70,000 worth of income per year. 
So there's some significant inequalities that persist, not only in the UK, but across the world, as we know. And the problem that um, the way uh, we cur currently generate and distribute wealth is no longer translating into kind of improvements in our quality of life and leaving actually many people worse off. So at what point do we need to ask ourselves um, whether we've actually arrived at our end destination and then instead of continuing to focus on generating more wealth we should actually focus on harnessing the benefits of the wealth that we that we already have. Gemma can you move on and you know we, we, we've seen this during the pandemic but you know the pandemic is hopefully um, for only a short period of time relative to some of the bigger issues we actually need to tackle over the next 10, 20, 30 years such as uh, climate change and the, the problem we've seen endlessly with governments is that, you know, we, as we strive to navigate kind of urgent crises like the pandemic and, and the climate emergency, it become, can be quite frustrating for people to see policymakers prioritise the economy above everything else. You know, forgetting fundamentally that we as a society are the economy uh, and actually it means nothing if we end up destroying the planet or... Uh, not providing a, a safe, stable community for people to live in. Gemma, can you move on? So I think, that, you know, the, the question needs to that we need to start to ask ourselves is, is where does that leave us? And, you know, we, we currently have an uneven economy in the UK and across the world. I mean, eight people, I think, I think at recent measurements, the eight wealthiest people in the world have more wealth than half of the rest of the world combined. And um, that that measure is is something which is is easily seen in the UK as well. Uh, Gemma, if you want to move on, and you know we also need to consider how what kind of if impacts the kind of economy and this endless striving towards economic development, economic growth actually, what kind of impacts it actually has on people. And it you know we have an economy that does create direct health consequences with increasing loneliness, alienation, despair, you know, be, becoming an increasing health and well-being concern for many of many developed countries and depressed, depression now becoming the leading cause of, cause of disability across the world. And, you know, you can directly relate that back to the type of um, economy we, we strive to create. So Gemma, can you move on? So, so the, the kind of question we, as economic development professionals, we've started to ask ourselves over a, a number of years now is what is the answer to that and and really there's a building piece of work which suggests that we you know we need to start going back to basics and realize we cannot continue to focus on this endless path towards economic growth which focuses solely on a measure of the measure of success being gdp we need to consider a broader measure of success built around economic well-being Gemma. Um, so I think this is this is quite an interesting graph, which which comes from a piece of work, at actually the start of the pandemic, done by the Guardian, which asked what, um, yeah, looking beyond the pandemic, once we start to get out of it, what should the uh, UK prioritise? And you know, overwhelmingly, people felt it was the health and well-being of, of citizens rather than economic growth, and. Um, so I think, you know, two year, almost two years on from when this survey was done, I think if, if that was repeated, I think most people would probably argue they'd say exactly the same again. So, you know, if the pandemic has taught us anything, it's that well-being, that of our friends, neighbours is far more important as an overarching drive of what pe most people see as a well-functioning society rather than some kind of false measure of success based upon GDP, which frankly nobody really understands anyway. Um, Gemma, can you move on? So we, so we have a choice um, and we have a choice as policymakers to decide which lens we look at the problem as, of societal development through. And, and largely, when you look at this, there's, there's three principal lenses you can look at this problem through. There's an economic growth lens, there's an environmental lens and there's a well-being lens. And whichever lens you prioritise affects the way you view the other two, two problems. So it's a bit like a kaleidoscope. So if you, if you look through a kaleidoscope, whichever lens you look through first impacts on how you view the next two, two or three or four lenses beyond that. And at the moment, economic development is always viewed through an economic lens. 
that is the principal driver. And that means we focus on things like inclusive growth and green retrofitting. We fit the environment and well-being of society around our drive towards economic growth. So inclusive growth is about repairing the damage which economic growth creates. Green retrofitting is about repairing the damage that the economy and the environment uh, creates. But what economic well-being tries to do is change what that principal lens is, such that we view the economy and environment through the lens of well-being. So it, it draw, it, it, it's an underpinning towards what we want to achieve around well-being rather than a means in, a means in itself. Gemma? Thank you. Um, so this is a, a, effectively what this, this slide outlines, where you know, the current way of working is you grow the economy first. You extract wealth from people through taxes to do that. And then you fix the damages done to people and planet. So I'm not a massive fan of inclusive growth as a label. Um, and it's, it's become quite prevalent within economic development over the last decade, particularly. There's always slightly different, slight different variations on it. But all it is, is you've got growth and you're trying to make it inclusive. So you try to retrofit people around the problem after you've created the problem in the first place so it's it's retrospective rather than trying to address the problem up front and making the way we approach the economy fair from the outset Gemma would you move on so you know the, the, the question really is therefore how do we move from just fixing the negative outcomes of our economy to actually building an economic system that gets it right in the first place and this is many people have probably seen this this image before in different ways and um the, you know fundamentally what we're talking about here is is actually creating a system which doesn't require uh fundamental changes to the way we approach um the economy and and, and, and societal development generally in order to make sure that people get um fair share of the opportunities Gemma move on thank you um but there's no one size fits all with this. And the concept of economic uh, well-being and well-being economy comes under all sorts of different banners, such as inclusive growth, sustainable development, donut economics, circular economy. There's all sorts of different labels people attach to this. And um, I think probably the one which has got most traction over the last few years is the concept of community well-being or otherwise called as the Preston model. Um, but the, there are no right or wrong answers to this. Um, there's just the right solution for us in Wakefield. And, and, and this is the work we, we want to be doing over the, the coming months. Gemma, would you move on? So what does this actually mean in practice? Because all that is, is all well and good. It's all very theoretical. It all sounds very nice and, and uh, aspirational. But actually, what does it mean for people on the ground? So actually, when you start looking at this, uh, in fact, a lot of the stuff we're actually already doing, and, and if you ask people and, and put these in front of them, they'd probably say, actually, no, that's the right thing to do anyway. So, you know, what does it mean? It, you know, it means investing in public space and placemaking to foster local pride in communities, enabling the community to take part in, in um, their own development. So participate, participatory planning, for example. Um, and I'm happy to get into that in a bit more detail later. Um, you know, facilitating slower lifestyles, encouraging cycling and walking infrastructure, co-creating, co-own, creating entrepreneur communities, growing from within rather than attracting in with investment, um, lifelong learning, which we, we prioritise very much within Wakefield, as we know, high quality, affordable public transport. Public transport is a great leveller in society. Um, you know, quality of opportunities, can be directly related back to how well you're able to access those opportunities in the first place. Capturing more local spend, progressive procurement practices, which is very much what the Preston model talks about, uh, spend locally. Um, so all of these, all of these things, we actually, when you put them down on paper, are actually eminently achievable. And actually we're already striving towards achieving most of them. Um, but I think it's fair to say some are easier to achieve than others and some require a bit more effort, a bit more acceleration behind what we're already doing to actually try and achieve them. Gemma, would you mind moving on? Thank you. Um, so how do we how do we actually get there? So um, how do we, as both the council and wider partners, begin to pivot our approach 
to focus less on economic growth, um, which, it, which, which it might seem ironic coming from me, given the fact that my job title is corporate director for economic growth, uh, and more on economic well-being. Um, whilst recognising it is, is much about the journey we go on in that process rather than the end destination, we need to adapt and evolve over time, try different things, rather than seeing this as a solution that can change the world in the next three years. That's not what we're talking about here. It might sound very nice theoretically, but some of these change ideas requires time um, and, and effort to, to get there. Um, Gemma? So what the council has recently started to do following a cabinet decision back in the autumn was um, to start working with the New Economics Foundation on a project which starts to try and answer some of these questions. And the project will be ongoing throughout 2022 and, and it seeks to formulate a new approach to economic development in the district and in what we're calling the Wakefield model. Um, for those who don't know the Econ New Economics Foundation, there are a um, national think tank, been going for a number of years now and have been at the forefront of championing a new approach to economic development focused on well-being. Um, there's a number of think tanks nationally and internationally who uh, are now starting to look at this but uh, quite a lot of them are wedded to one model or another so the Centre for Local Economic Strategies who are based in Manchester are very wedded and championing the um, community wealth building model based around local procurement spend but what we wanted to do here is not um, necessarily focus on one model or another or simply expect that what might work elsewhere could be applied and work, work here. So what we want to do is be authentic and make sure we build our model from the bottom up rather than expecting solutions to come from elsewhere, hence the Wakefield model. So the New Economic Foundation's work will take a couple of phases. The phase one being information gathering, listening and learning uh, in the coming months and starting to develop ideas from the ground up. Um, particularly utilising the, the forthcoming big conversation work, which um, myself and Anna originally started talking about around six months ago now, and uh, I'm really pleased to see it's now getting some traction because it was originally identified, the original conversation myself and Anna had was around how we could we use some form of patisserie, patriarchy, democratic engagement process to inform this work around economic well-being, but it was quite evident actually could be far more useful in, in order to shape the council's overall priorities going forward but the the big conversation work will be quite fundamental to the evidence base to around this economic well-being model so once we've got that gone through that process what we what we want to do then in terms of phase two will be taking that and starting to co-design pilot projects and beginning to test those ideas in practice there will be a plan at the end of it because everybody likes to see a plan everybody likes to see where we're heading but the point of this is very much to actually get on and do stuff rather than not just simply talking about it and having some warm words on paper. And, and it will be an iterative process. It will be trial and error. Some things will work and we'll scale that up. If it doesn't, we'll move on and try something else. So this is not about, um, in the words of uh, one of my former bosses, one of his favorite, fa favorite analogies was, let's not try and boil the ocean. And, and that's exactly what we're not we're trying to do here. We're not trying to change the world in three years, but we're trying to move towards a new model, which both the, the council and partners can start to get behind. Where actually we start to take investment decisions and where we want to spend our money based upon trying to achieve different outcomes rather than continuing to, continually trying to chase this, this mythical end destination around economic growth and GDP growth. It just simply hasn't worked and it won't work. So that so the New Economics Foundation are really at the kind of foothills of that work at the moment. They're just starting to the, their engagement with us. And um, just move on to the last slide, Gemma. Thank you. Um, and But this will very much go throughout this year, as I said. So we had a cabinet report in October, which um, cabinet agreed for us to pursue this, this uh, path. Um, NEF have now uh, been secured this month. A uh, big conversation, uh, Anna will correct me if I'm wrong on this, will start kind of early to mid this year. Um, we hope to kind of get phase one complete uh, around about September and then the plan will be in place by the end of the year. 
and then we'll start to kind of roll out some of these um, pilot initiatives from next year onwards and the intention is as i said it will feed into helping to inform uh, a new investment plan um, to shape kind of how the council wishes to utilize its capital program and its investment programs going forward from 2023 onwards and uh, we, the council's just adopted a new corporate plan uh, but that was always seen as a, as a short-term solution whilst we undertake the big conversation we do this economic well-being work uh, and ultimately this will help feed into that no, new corporate plan in two years time as well so that's a bit of a, a, a canter through Maureen but hopefully I've I've expanded a little bit on some of the cryptic uh, slides that were sent out in advance but I'm happy to answer any more questions or have a bit of a discussion around some of this. Okay thank you for that uh, Mark if we can take the that's it that's lovely so I can see everybody yeah I've been I've been writing one or two things down uh, as we've gone through um, it seems an awful long um, campaign if you like from now until 2024 to to, to actually seeing or, or getting any results but just to come back to uh, one of your slides which was the uh, penultimate slide and, and and phase two where you talk about engagement and you talk about uh, working with Anna and the big conversation which I think is fantastic um, but your actual your your actual slide says engage with workers and, and workers organizations what about the public what about the public in general is that where the big conversation comes in I'll bring you in in a second Anna but is that where the big conversation comes in it, and, and if so somebody seeing this this particular slide, like myself, would have thought, well, where do I fit into all this? I don't seem to have been considered um, because one of the slides just says big conversation. Not a lot of people know uh, what the big conversation is uh, and what we're hoping to achieve with that. So I think it's about me as a, a member of the general public. Wonderful. You know, we all know. And, and Joe Webster said to me when I took over this this uh, portfolio, there are only three things people want, and that's their own home, to be warm and to be loved, and to be able to support the families. And, and really that's what we need to get to, uh, as well as talking about economic growth. Uh, if you have that, then people spend in the economy and your economy grows anyway. So I just don't see where I fit in as a member of the public within this within this plan and I think that's what came through when I originally read through the presentation yeah so I think I think that's a fair challenge more it and you're absolutely right it is that's going to be the role of the big conversation in order to engage a wider group of people who wouldn't normally talk about this kind of stuff um, because you know when you start talking about economic development or economic growth you throw in things such as GDP you know, it, it completely turns people off. I mean, what that just doesn't relate to most people. And I, I think the way you've just described it there in terms of kind of measures of success, you know, do we live in a, a safe, warm house? Are we loved? I think, you know, that's the kind of thing which people relate to. And, you know, I was, I think as many people probably was, I was watching the news the other night and the, the, as, as seems to be every night at the moment, there's a discussion around the impending fuel poverty crisis. And you know there was a there was a family on there from West Yorkshire, um, young boy that was being interviewed lives lives in the house with his mum and his his family and you know got one carpet in the house and you know if if um, can't afford to heat the house as it is never mind when fuel prices go up that's tackling things like that that's that's real measure of success you know it's not not some mythical story about economic growth and gdp that people can't relate to that so i think uh, you know this the work on the big conversation is going to be absolutely fundamental to make sure we engage a wider group of people in this conversation that normally wouldn't won't participate it's actually actively going out there and starting those discussions with people rather than passively sitting back and waiting for them to come to us so uh, I know Anna can expand f further on that, but that's absolutely at the heart of what, what is intended to, to happen, isn't it, Anna? Yes, I, I mean, absolutely, totally agree, but we need to get that message out. And I'm sure we're going to get that out through the through the big conversation because, you know, what the last thing you want, I can I can paste the, these walls in my office with strategies and policies and, yeah. and, and, and statements and, and, and that sort of thing it's what we're going to achieve at the end of it 
and how we get there. And, and Anna's actually put into the chat, somewhere safe to live, something meaningful to do and somewhere, someone to love. And I think that's absolutely key. And that should be our messages through uh, the big conversation. That's what we're actually trying to achieve. Uh, Anna, I'll bring you in and then Joe. Yeah, I think it's just um, so it was Mark's leadership that initially brought in the New Economics Foundation and it was their idea to have the big conversation. And then because Mark and I have been working very closely together, I volunteered to lead on that bit of it because it seemed to sit really well with, you know, I know the Health and Wellbeing Board and, and where we wanted to be with things. And um, so actually we, we sort of have been working hand in glove right, right from the beginning. Um, and I think it was always, you know, really clear that the big conversation was a, a mechanism to actually take take a very new approach and, and, and you know, uh, a very uh, an approach right across the district to really understand what was important to local residents. And then Mark with, had, will, will make sure that that's then reflected. I mean, you know, this is mu this presentation's music to my ears and um, because we know that um, we can only reduce health inequalities by around 10% in terms of healthcare services. Um, but actually, the, the, if everybody did have a safe home, if everybody did have a meaningful job that paid the real living wage, then a lot of our work would be done. Um, and previously, we've tried hard to kind of engage with um, economic growth and, and, and development. And I feel like, you know, we need to build those that really, really strong relationship with Mark and his co and colleagues. Um, and um, we, it, it's timely that it's come to this board because we've got oh, the, the refreshed the health and wellbeing strategy um, yes. and the health oh. wellbeing strategy. Um, oh, yeah. Lee, I think you need to be on silent. Oh. Do you want to just put yourself on mute, Lee? No, Sorry, that's, my, that's, my teach, that's my teacher voice coming out there. Did you <laughs> <stop that>? um, <laughs> Was a, one of my career aspirations but a very long time ago I would have been a rubbish teacher I have to say but occasionally it just comes out and um, so I think um the, the health wellbeing strategy which I know people have seen a draft of is very very clear that we have the four outcomes and one of the outcomes is healthy standard of living and I think this sits beautifully within that um you know uh we've we've had an aspiration for a long time as a health and wellbeing board that we would really engage around you know we've Sarah Roxby's led some fabulous work on housing um, and now this to me is the logical next step so really really pleased that Mark has come today really really like his thinking on this and um, you know really excited about about the next step. I think it will shape our uh, the health and wellbeing board's priorities going forward I'm pretty sure of that. Uh, Joe, you're next. I can't repeat anything if I'm new. Um, I won't repeat what Anna's just said, but welcome the conversation. I think um, Mark's leadership's brought a different thinking to, um, to this standard as part of our health and wellbeing uh, strategy. I think what I'm keen to do, Mark, is work with you and Anna to understand how the partnership of health and care providers and how our neighbourhood model, how, we, how we're engaging with our uh, local people can support the work of the district in wanting to make sure that we've got um, strong economic well-being. So I think we need to work with you to identify in our annual operating plan what's the contribution we make to this as health and care providers and how can we as employers, we as service offers, you know, all those things that that we can contribute so and I know we've had many conversations well not many but we've had some conversations about that so building on some of the work that we'd already done around housing the step up program for employment you know um etc cetera, etc cetera. so I think they're the kind of things that that we probably need to bring back at a later stage but yeah really welcome it and thanks for bringing it to life for us again and I think we need to understand, as, as an ordinary member of the public, what uh, understanding what economic well-being is. Because yeah. economic well-being, for me, suggests businesses, not the economy. It suggests businesses. And I think if we, we have to come, to, if, we, if, if we're really uh, serious about helping people who are vulnerable achieve the three uh, I I initiatives or the three uh, things that uh, Anna mentions, then we need to make sure they understand how we how we're going to do that and get there. So we understand economic well-being, but the ordinary man in the street or, or woman in the street probably won't understand that. And I think that's it's how you put something over uh, as well that that for me uh, is important. And Maddie's just saying that uh, the voluntary sector can support 
uh, with that message. And I think it's actually crucial uh, that we do that. Adam, you, you're next. Yeah, thank you, Maureen. Um, I totally agree with what you're saying. We need to try and bring this to life and understand how we can measure it, nurture it. Um, like you said, we can have all the policies, et cetera, and aspirations, but really how are we going to see and make a change? Now, I think the presentation that Ruth will deliver in terms of the health and wellbeing strategy is absolutely linked to all of this. And you'll see, you know, the outcomes of engagement and actually what local people want in terms of their health and wellbeing, what they see as a good achievement. And I think that needs to be the key. I really enjoyed the presentation. The terminology um, economic well-being perhaps is a little bit difficult for you know average person in Wakefield to understand and appreciate but I think it's our job to try and describe what that is and and I think as we de develop the health and well-being strategy and actually deliver what people have asked us to do and what makes a difference to them and their family and their position in the community and the places where they live I think that will start to crystallize out um but i just wanted to thank you for for bringing the presentation today it really made sense to me thank you thanks adam thank you i've nobody else that's indicated to uh, to actually ask a question i will ask you to wind up in a second mark but i think uh, for, for me what are the next steps and and i really do think we have to mean what we say and we have to deliver what we say uh, if it's only small things rather than saying a a, a whole you know, book it full of things, and we know we're not going to be able to deliver that. But as 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 the you know the 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 three phrases that we've used around, uh, and I've written them down around around uh, safe places to live, meaning things, meaningful things to do, and somebody to love. I think really those are the headlines we need to be promoting. And I think uh, that if you promote that and then start to ask the questions of everybody, then I think uh, you know they feel as though they've been engaged with. Mark, would you like to wind up? No, that, that's fine. Mo. That's been really helpful. And I think I think uh, it's a really useful challenge around the how we define this. And it may be that we, we try and not define it too closely because otherwise it starts to kind of narrow down the discussion. So um, I think I think the one thing we can definitely avoid is calling it donut economics, because I don't think uh, referring to anything donut is going to help anything to do with health and well-being anyway. So we'll, we'll definitely avoid that one. Uh, but uh, yeah, we'll, we'll take that away and have a think a little bit about kind of what do we call this, which is a bit more accessible because anything to do with economics tends to be very inaccessible for people anyway. And it, some, of, some of it even goes over my head and it's supposed to be my day job as well. So I, I, I don't blame people. So yeah, that really helpful, Maureen. Thank you very much for the invite and happy to come back at any point in the future as we get through this piece of work and continue the discussions. Yeah, I think we'd like we'd like timely sort of um, updates on, on 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 what's happening, and I'm sure that Anna will point us in the direction of when it is that we want an update when there's something uh, really good and firm to tell us. So uh, you're more than welcome to stay, Mark, but I know you're a busy man, so we will understand uh, if it is that you leave. Um, okay, on to the next agenda item, Ruth. It is the health and wellbeing strategy refresh. If you'd like to bring us up to the date on where we are there, please. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, and I think it's it's really helpful just following on from that presentation from Mark, because it, this health and wellbeing strategy is all about connectivity um, with with economic growth, with what's going on in transport, in other departments um, and with the whole of the, the council's corporate plan. Um, so if I just sort of set the context, I appreciate everybody will have had the opportunity to read the draft strategy. But I think what we agreed in July was that we wanted to refresh the strategy we set quite an ambitious timetable around doing that because we wanted that strategy to be in place to set out what our high level ambitions are to inform our planning for the next the, the next financial year. Um, and that that broadly is what the strategy is, is there to do. Um, at the last meeting, we brought quite a comprehensive report of all of the things that have been delivered since the last strategy. And I think what that demonstrated was that the decision we took in July to stick with the same priorities was the right decision because what we've got is a, a series of priorities where we've made significant progress but still work to do and and so that's 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 what we've set out in terms of the process that we've gone through i think 
it has been um, particularly given the time that we had to do it it has been a very robust process and it follows the process that um, has been used for the corporate plan as well which is a combination of looking at what the data tells us and then listening to what our stakeholders tell us so we've done a review of the joint strategic needs assessment and alongside that health watch ran a piece of work where they sought views from the public and we've also done some engagement with the broader sort of business sector and other other council departments and the health and health leadership to try and understand what is it that we we need to do to really embed a health and well-being strategy in the district and we brought all of that together in a session at the end of December where stakeholders from all of those various um, organisations, representatives, were able to deliberate and think about, so what does that tell us? What are the priorities? And that, in effect, has then produced what we now has, have as a strategy. In terms of joint strategic needs assessment, I think we've, we've pulled out the sort of highlights. So rather than going into the detail of kind of statistics, what we've pulled out is some of the sort of key themes that come out of that. And I think there are some really significant things. One is about the impact of inequality and, and how that affects people's health. We know that people in the Wakefield district have a shorter life expectancy than elsewhere in the country. And significantly, we also know that people live longer in poor health, and that's the bit that we want to try and tackle. And what we also know is that there are a number of things that affect people's health, which are entirely preventable. And with the right support and the right investment, we can start to make some real inroads into those. So that's the kind of note of optimism. Um, and we also know that um, mental health, self-harm, suicide are all really significant things for our population, all, all have a significant detrimental impact. In terms of what people told us, so um, I think the, the piece of work that Healthwatch did involved both, both the survey and conversations with individuals and some focus groups, so we've got some quite rich feedback from that, and what it tells us broadly is that one in five people in the population um, don't feel they're living a healthy life. So the majority of people feel okay, feel like their life is quite healthy and that they've got a healthy lifestyle, but there's this, a, a significant pocket of people who don't. Um, and significantly, whilst a lot of people felt their physical health was good, the, the people's reflections on the mental health was not so positive. And I think that is significant given that this piece of work was taking place over the summer and autumn of last year as we were coming out of the, the initial lockdown period. So you would have expected slightly more optimism. It certainly isn't um, that that reflection on people's emotional and mental well-being is less likely to have been skewed because they were isolated it, through those lockdown restrictions. Um, and then I think the other thing that, that people talk about a lot in, in their feedback is not particularly about health services, although it features a little bit and you know, it shouldn't be ignored, but it's about healthiness and what, what constitutes healthiness is around physical activity um, and, and those sort of three components that Anna described earlier in terms of, you know, somewhere safe to live, someone to love and um, meaningful activity. Those are the things, the sort of connections and acti activity are the things that really make a difference. And then the, the other thing that I think was really striking in terms of the feedback was the, the relationship between health and happiness, that when we asked people, so if you were healthier, what difference would it make? Most people said it would make me happier. And I think that's a really important thing because ultimately that's what, that, was what, that would be what we would want for our population is to feel happy. Um, and to feel fulfilled in their lives. In terms of partners and the feedback that we got from partners, the significant things there were really about recognising how much employers, other council departments, um, some of the big public sector organisations, how much they feel that they can make a contribution to better health. And I think that gives us some real levers and we had some really helpful, interesting feedback in the workshop session, which was about um, organisations really wanting to be better employers, to be able to contribute more to wellbeing, but also recognising that some of the decisions that, um, that organisations make about how they employ people, who they recruit into the workforce, what apprenticeship opportunities they offer, those sort of things can make a really massive difference too. Um, so what we've done against each of the priorities is we've set out um, a range of themes that we intend to focus on. 
Um, we have then described um, in the section what, what, what might you see that's different. We've described um, effectively what will form the basis of an outcomes framework. So those are the things that as we move through the delivery of this strategy, we will measure have we actually made a difference in these areas. The intention is that um, from this strategy document, there'll be an annual plan developed for each of the priorities, there will be a lead and a, and a programme board arrangement. So as we currently have, um, it's described in there that um, for children and young people's, Beate is the lead for that. There is a children and young people's programme board that will focus on all of those priorities. And that programme board will have a series of um, agreed measures that they will look at, that will report back to the health and wellbeing board so that we can really clearly see what difference we're making. So sort of put a, a, an example of how we might do that um if if our target is about um dealing with some of the health impacts of smoking in the first year some of the things that we might do might be about restricting access to smoking to to um to to cigarette smoke or it might be about um uh, some of the things like um access to smoking cessation classes in the second year we might start to look at what's the impact in terms of the numbers of people in the population starting smoking in the third year we might look at what are the number of people in the population who who are stopping smoking and then we you, you over the sort of longer period the sort of eight to ten years you might start to see an impact in terms of reduction in cardiovascular disease so it's that being able to set out for each of these what, what sort of measures would we look at? We've also um, in there described some of the methods that we will use. So we talked a lot in the last presentation about the sort of the engagement, but we've, we've, we've talked about how we will engage using um, mechanisms such as the big conversation. Um, given the conversations that we've had with employers about what, what employers feel that they can contribute, I think there's a real opportunity to look at extending some of the work that we're doing around anchor organisations and then the, the, the whole connectivity with other departments and other strategies. Um, I think it's probably helpful just to pick up um, in terms of how we've aligned it to the corporate plan. So obviously the, the timing was really helpful in terms of um, council having an ambition about a corporate plan that is focused on health in all policies and what we've what we've done is reflect the those priorities in the corporate plan that have a health and well-being lens to them um, and we've also drawn the connection with some of the work that's been done and looking at the priorities for budget setting for the next year and I think there's a lot of common ground in there in terms of um, revitalization of places, the opportunities about meaningful activity and about volunteering, things about filling the skills gap, that there's, there's clearly a, on one hand employers looking for skills and on the other hand people looking for meaningful work and, and, and reward for that. Um, and then things around green space and climate, all of those are reflected in the council's priorities but also reflected in the, in the health and wellbeing um, strategy. And then I think just the other thing that it's probably helpful for me to reflect is that as part of the process, we've had two discussions with the Overview and Scrutiny Committee for Adults and Health. Um, the first of those was um, to talk about the process. The second was to talk about what we've achieved already. And on, on the back of that, we've had feedback from them. And I think everything that the Overview and Scrutiny Committee wanted us to reflect in the health and wellbeing strategy, I, I feel is covered in terms of they wanted a strong focus on social determinants, strong focus on health inequalities, um, factors such as uh, living conditions, lifestyles, rather than a focus on services. And they wanted to see a strong link between the corporate plan and linkages between planning and health and how as we grow our economy and grow our district grow the population we're, we're making the connection between that and, and what the impact of that is for health so I, i'm confident that we've we've covered what overview and scrutiny wanted us to look for the the other um issue that overview and scrutiny highlighted was how do we use the plan and the strategy as a tool for um for clarifying the relationship between health and wellbeing boards. So the health and wellbeing board is responsible um, for overseeing the delivery of the plan, but the Overview and Scrutiny Committee would 
look at areas where we as a as a board identify that there's further work that needs to be done or further scrutiny needed so i think there's there's more that we can do to build on that as we go through um i think it's probably helpful at that point just to stop and uh, take any reflections on any additions that people want to see before we put this to the full council for approval. So I'll, I'll pause at that point if that's okay. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for that, uh, Ruth. I've, and, and I've just been looking both at uh, at the report that we got from the uh, the overview and scrutiny. I think I think you're absolutely right. It's very very balanced, uh, and I think yes, um, you know, it would be the the suggestion that they make about. Um, uh, any non-delivery, if we can refer to them, then they can be a, a, a big help to us. And I think that's that's absolutely uh, correct. I suppose, I, 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 and in the full meeting, I'm going to say that um, the the um, the strategy will go, uh, obviously, the route it goes. And, and it's a, a, a lengthy document. I think it's something like, I don't know, 15, 17 pages long, uh, which you know, again, the general public are not going to, they're not going to read. Um, so I'd like something, you know, uh, I think when it when it is that we've, we, we've decided that we're okay to move forward, that I think, you know, we, we need to do um, a public version, a version that's easy to read, you know, with some pictures and infographics. And of course, it just needs to be based on the four priorities. And and, and at the end of the uh, document, you talk about how we how we'll know we've made a difference. And, and just to put bullet points in, this is how we're going to measure our success. Uh, but I do think, you know, no more than four pages so that we can uh, we can get that. And, and I know I've said that to you before, and I know we've agreed it before, but just want to get that uh, into the uh, into the meeting and I think it's it's and you've just mentioned it it's vital that we do link it to the corporate plan then it then we act with, we know we work together but at least if we link it to the corporate plan then it looks as though we're working together to to, to everyone else so um, I mean I, I I'm more than happy with the document and I think you know one or two people have had some input in there uh, and I think we're coming up with something that's really special so um at that point, I'll shut up. Are there any questions to Ruth? Comments, clarification? Oh, you stunned us into silence, Ruth. Stunned us into silence. Um, do you want to carry on? Is, is, is there more? No, it was only really just to say that um, in terms of what next, um, there is an intention that we will put together, as you say, a summary document that's more accessible to the public. Um, and then we will work on the development of an annual plan that falls out of this, that will really form the basis of the business, both of the Wakefield District Health and Care Partnership in terms of delivery and the Health and Wellbeing Board in terms of monitoring the progress of that. Um, what now needs to happen with it is I've obviously had some detailed comments back from from Joe before the meeting that I need to just weave into the the, the document and then it formally is uh, has to be approved by the the full council in February so it'll go forward to that process in February. So that's all. Thank you. Is, is there a process where we as a health and wellbeing board see that final draft and and, and okay it or are we now out of the process? I just feel that we should be saying yes, we're happy with this document. Are you happy? I mean, it's it's very minor amends. So if you're happy to just sign that off, I think that if if that's okay, or I can circulate it around everybody if if you prefer. Okay, Joe, you wanted to come in. Yeah, I think we do need to sign it off. I think every partner on this board needs to be committed to delivering and playing their part in that, whether that's their individual organisations being responsible for some of the four priorities or through the partnership because we'll be doing that collectively together. So I think we do need to formally agree, Maureen, that we are happy with the content of this, that we understand the process for delivering, albeit that the annual operating plan for this district is still yet to be determined through the partnership arrangements. And we'll, you know, I'll take that forward as place lead. Um, and that, that we'll take that through the, the council because of its relationship, it's a formal subcommittee of the council. That's why it needs to go to, to full council and cabinet. So um, but I think you're right. I think we do need to agree uh, today that we're happy with it. Okay, well, I think it's 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 quite straightforward. Uh, we've got our four priorities, which are, and I'm reading them, healthy standard of living for all, 
giving every child the best start in life, sustainable communities and preventing ill health. Those are the four priorities. And right at the end of the document, uh, it tells us how we're going to how we're going to get there and how we're going to measure success. Uh, I think everybody was given the opportunity to comment from the last meeting in November up until the meeting today. Uh, and I'm presuming that those uh, who wanted to comment have already commented. And I'm taking that because there are no there's no one wants any question or clarity on anything that Ruth has said. I am presuming that we all agree uh, this document going forward to its next step with just a few minor amendments, which will be a dot and a comma, I suspect, from, uh, from Joe being inserted in there. Um, I'm going to take silence as approval to the document. If it is that anybody has anything to say, then please speak up now or forever hold your peace, as they say. So, right, we take silence as approval, Ruth. I think we can move to the next step. I'm certainly happy with the document. Uh, I think it's really good. And I thank you for the work that you've put into it. You and, and, and I suspect Anna's had a hand in there somewhere. Uh, so thank you for the work that you've put into that. It is a good document and something that we're going to be proud of over the years to come. So, so thank you. We'll take it to the thank next you. step. OK, thank you. Um, next item on the agenda is my friend Steve Turnbull and Jessica Parker on suicide prevention. Uh, you are early. I do. Uh, I know that you've joined us. So if you would like to take us, uh, Steve, is it Steve or Jess that's taking us through this? Uh, I'm going to start, um, um, Maureen, and then uh, hand over to, to Jess later. Uh, so and I think Gemma's uh, presenting the, the slides. So we'll we'll go through these and I'm sure we'll have time for, for questions. So. Uh, uh, so if we move on to the next slide, really. So I mean, some overarching comments to start with around suicides. Uh, I mean, the, de the death of any anybody uh, affects other people, but suicide deaths tend to affect more people than you would first uh, understand. Uh, death by suicide is, is never expected. It's always a shock. Uh, and we always liken it to a, a stone landing on a lake uh, and the ripples spread far and wide. Uh, and I forget the actual uh, numbers, but research suggests something like for every suicide, there's 160, 170 people uh, who can be impacted. Uh, so that that's you know obviously immediate family, uh, friends. Uh, if it's in a public place where the the act happens, then it's it's bystanders and people who discover the body, uh, frontline staff who, who attend uh, events, uh, and then obviously workplace colleagues and and, and wider communities uh, get affected. So it, it is something that that thankfully is, is relatively small numbers, although rates are, are too high. Uh, but uh, it, it, it does have well, long-term uh, impacts on, on many different people. Uh, if you move to the next slide, please. Uh, and um, just to put some numbers in there ac across uh, UK and uh, Republic of Ireland, it's 6,000 uh, people a year, but obviously that's the, that's the tip of the iceberg. Um, there are lots more people who, who attempt suicide. There's lots more people who have suicidal thoughts. Um, so it, 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 there's a hidden iceberg uh, um, all around suicide prevention. And whilst our uh, focus is often on that, that bit that we can see, we must remember that to uh, prevent suicides, we have to prevent suicide, uh, suicidal behaviours and suicide uh, issues that are, that are below the surface and, and largely hidden. Um, and we do know that uh, suicides can be prevented. Uh, and you know, if we intervene correctly and follow the evidence, and in many ways, we're at the early days of understanding suicides and how we should uh, respond to them. Uh, but we need to stay uh, abreast of the evidence and try and uh, intervene uh, as a community uh, uh, going forward. So uh, next slide, please. And, and just to, uh, as you, this, is, this is such an obvious thing uh, that, that suicides and suicidal thoughts are complex, uh, the complex, there isn't a single reason why people uh, are brought to the conclusion that suicide is an option for them. Um, it can be previous mental health disorders, it can be uh, genetic factors, it can be um, all sorts of environmental and economic issues and family issues, relationship issues. Um, what we, we tend to find though is that we all understand that. And then when uh, a, a sad event happens and somebody takes their own life, people generally then want to find a single solution. Oh, that was because they you know, they, they had a divorce or they, they lost a job or they've been in uh, some other kind of problems. Uh, and, and it's not the case. Uh, it's, it's 
anybody who's uh, taken their own life has done that for many different complicated reasons. And in order to uh, prevent those, we need complicated solutions, um, which can't be uh, laid at the door of any one organization. It has to be something that crosses all kind of organizations, uh, both public and, and private. Uh, and, and it needs to go into communities uh, as well. So we speak very often around having suicide aware communities um, because you don't know when you may be having to deal with somebody who's, uh, who's presenting some suicidal thoughts. Uh, so it's, uh, it, it's not something that can rest with, with one particular organization. Um, and, on, and indeed in place as well, we often find when we investigate suicides that the, the nature of our uh, society at the minute is you may start investigating a situation in Wakefield, but before you know it, you're talking to groups of people in Leeds. Uh, and so working across uh, West Yorkshire is important and, and Jess will, will touch on that, I'm sure. Uh, move to the next slide, please. Uh, this, I really don't like uh, talking through, through this slide. This shows uh, Wakefield's rates um, ag against the uh, England average. Uh, there's a couple of things to, and the, one of the reasons I don't like talking about it is, is I don't want to sound like I'm, I'm talking uh, this away because you can see that we are significantly above the national average and going the wrong direction. So it, it, that is concerning for, for a start. Uh, <clears throat> the two things I'd, I'd like to mention on that is, well, probably three things. One is we are dealing with relatively small numbers. So numbers fluctuate over time very rapidly. So these are averaged over three years. Uh, and and we've had uh, in Wakefield a couple of, uh, in, in the years where this um, these numbers relate to, which is 2018 to 2020 is the most recent figures. We've had some significant uh, issues with suicide and a couple of uh, suicide clusters in young people and young adults which have skewed our data uh, the wrong direction. Um, we hope um, that, that we will uh, move past this and we'll, we'll try and see a reduction, but we have to um, be, we have to take that on, on the chin really, that we, we are looking at uh, rates that are significantly above the national average. The, the other thing to, to mention is that uh, it's difficult to see on the national picture, but during the, the time of this chart, the um, the evidence of um, so we we only can talk about a suicide in an individual when the coroner determines it to be a suicide. <clears throat> and during the time scale of this chart, the burden of proof changed. It used to be that you had to have a criminal level of evidence to uh, for the coroner to determine whether a death was suicide. Now it's just uh, as the civil uh, uh, definition on the burden of, uh, um, on probability. Uh, so that's increased the number of suicides uh, and the Office for National Statistics is trying to understand how that has changed. But there is no doubt that uh, over a number of years, both locally and nationally, we've seen uh, rates uh, increase, the, irrespective of that change in definition. Uh, the next two slides will just take you through uh, by male and females. More suicides are in males, uh, and uh, and you can see that we've, we've increased. But you can see the if you move on to the next slide, Gemma. Sorry, uh, you can see that we've even though the rates are smaller, we've had a significant increase in in female suicides, which again is significantly concerning. So we need to look at understanding uh, what's happening uh, in in that population. Uh, just to turn on to how we try and respond. Oh, sorry, just one more thing on, on the actual numbers. You can see the numbers on the left hand side um, by by year. Uh, so we did have a couple of uh, significantly challenging years in, in 20, uh, well, 20, all those years are, are too many. Uh, and just to touch on this whilst, uh, whilst we're talking about numbers, there's, there was a lot of talk early on in the pandemic that, that uh, lockdowns and restrictions would uh, increase the number of suicides. We found that not to be the case um, in, both locally, nationally, and indeed internationally, all the evidence is saying that we've not seen an increase in suicides across the pandemic. And our 2020, uh, 2021 figures, uh, you can see there, they're January to October, looking like probably going to land at about the same kind of level as previous years. So we've not seen a, an increase, but there are some obviously concerns that post pandemic, uh, there'll, there'll be some more challenges in people's lives that, that may, uh, may put us uh, on, or put people in, in more risk of, of suicides. 
Uh, so if you move to the next slide, please, Gemma. Um, so we developed our Whitfield suicide prevention strategy in 2018, uh, and that runs until next year. Um, and I'll, I'll, I won't go through every priorities for action, uh, but just to say that, uh, that they're all listed there. And if anybody uh, wants a copy of that, um, that document, we can, we can obviously get that to them. It's been um, circulated far and wide. Uh, uh, we do, um, we, we did do a light touch review of it uh, in 2020 as um, in response to the pandemic and any uh, emerging themes. Um, but we have been advised from national um, suicide prevention leads that to let this uh, run to the end of its lifestyle lifespan, and then we shall look at a, a, another review. Uh, so we'll need to uh, do that over the next year uh, to start to look at what the 2023 strategy should look like. Uh, if you move to the next slide, please, then we... Uh, so yeah, strategy update to 2023, which will be in line with national guidance. Um, we are looking at how we make the best use of, of, of the data what normally happens is you, you conduct a suicide audit with um, with the coroner and we will look at doing that, but the data often is very uh, out of date by the time you get to it. Uh, and we, we feel like we need to do something that's uh, more, uh, a little bit faster and a little bit more um, updatable than, than rather than uh, a suicide audit every half a dozen years. It is a little bit too, too slow for us. So we, we were thinking about how to do that best. And the action plan, uh, is uh, divided into four sections. So those very much upstream suicide prevention activities, uh, a lot around reducing the stigma and joining campaigns around uh, positive mental health, how we respond to cases uh, of, of suicide and, and clusters, which uh, unfortunately we have uh, a fair amount of experience of in Wakefield over the last few years, developing post-prevention and suicide bereavement services. Uh, so these, uh, as I mentioned at the start, uh, suicides are like a, a stone landing in a lake. Uh, we really need to try and get good help to people who are closely uh, impacted. Uh, and uh, over the past few years, we've managed to secure funding from through the Mental Health Provider Alliance uh, and there's West Yorkshire funding into West Yorkshire service. So th those things have developed a, a great deal in the last couple of years. And then lastly, uh, partnership working. As I mentioned, we can't do this um, no organization can tackle suicide prevention by itself uh, and uh, i'm sure as the chair knows uh, i will come to very many meetings to talk about suicide prevention uh, so we, we do go to um, children's safeguarding board on occasion to talk around uh, suicide prevention uh, we do go to community safety partnership uh, and obviously the the overall governance is through the health and well-being board but we are more than willing to talk to any organization any partnership group to try and understand what uh, people can do to help with suicide prevention activities. Uh, just moving on to the next slide. Uh, as we come out of the pandemic, cross fingers touch wood, we, we will need to look at uh, our focus and focus is often on obviously on inequalities. We do know that there are some, um, there are some risk factors for suicides. Um, Pre-existing pre mental health can, can uh, obviously um, give you an uh, increased risk of suicide. But fundamentally, uh, what we've always seen after recessions uh, is an increase in suicides. Um, uh, and with cost of living increases and pressure on families, uh, family budgets, then that is another area that we will need to look at uh, over the next couple of years. Um, thankfully, children and young people rates are, are very low, but are extremely traumatic. Uh, and, and having a, a good focus on children and young people should never uh, go away, even though the, the risk is very low. It is, it is obviously very concerning when uh, a young person takes their own life. Uh, and you can see there, obviously, there's some specific uh, risks uh, as well. I mentioned people who are bereaved uh, already uh, and, and specific risks around domestic violence and alcohol. Should we, we, We'll need to look at all of those, but we'll need to build that on, on, what, on emerging evidence uh, at national and, and local level. Uh, I think that's my last slide, so I'll shall hand over to Jesse. We'll talk more about what's happening at West Yorkshire level. Thanks, Steve. Can everyone hear me? I've got a dodgy internet connection. Yeah, I can see some nods. So it's lovely to be invited today. Thanks for having me, and thanks, for Steve, for inviting me along as well. I've not met loads of you before. So I'm um, Jess Parker. I'm the Suicide Prevention Project Manager working in the West Yorkshire 
health and care partnership. Um, and I work right across the mental health and learning disabilities team, as well as the Improving Population Health Programme. Um, yeah, and like I say, it's great to be here. Um, do you want to get on the next slide? So I just thought what I'd do is I've, I've, I've been in post pretty much a year now um, in this role. So I'd give you a, a good update on, on what we've done across West Yorkshire and the impact of that or how that overlaps with what's going on in Wakefield. Um, so what's really important, I think, is that we're about to launch a new five year strategy for suicide prevention across West Yorkshire. And what that essentially does is looks at your local place based strategies and plans that Steve's just talked about um, in each of our five places. And then looks at we kind of went through a process of deciding what makes sense to do once right across West Yorkshire and what makes sense to do in our communities. And the strategy really, really just does talk to the West Yorkshire wide stuff and not the place based stuff. Um, we've got oversight of this from a um, suicide prevention oversight group where there's VCS, uh, public health and representation from SWIFT on that, on that group. And Steve uh, stepped up to chair the um, real-time suspected suicide uh, group for West Yorkshire as well. That's the interface between the police and the health and care system where we look at um, what's going on in real time in our communities. So thanks to Steve for that. There's been a little bit of investment um, into suicide prevention through a three-year programme and just to let you know that the decision was made that that was split roughly two-thirds down to places for place-based interventions and a third for system-wide delivery for West Yorkshire-wide delivery um, and we have decided to fund um, co-production through that so that means that people with lived experience will support us all to hopefully um, lead and oversee and make changes in suicide prevention work going forward. So what have we done in terms of insight and data? Well, Steve's giving you loads of stuff there, but we're really looking at streamlining the real-time surveillance system that I mentioned with police, uh, bringing in Yorkshire Ambulance Service and West Yorkshire Fire and Rescue as well, so that we get information from them in real times about what's happening with suicide, suspected suicides, but also hopefully suicide attempts as well, because that kind of information will give us opportunity to intervene. Um, uh, and the really critical thing about that as well is that we need to get better, I think, at joining up uh, bereaved people and recently bereaved people with a commission suicide bereavement service. At the moment, we're pretty good at it. Uh, we're, we're good at having those conversations, um, but we could, we could get better. And investment in the West Yorkshire Police will help, hopefully might make that happen. So we will have a person employed by the police working in the police to really link recently bereaved families up to the bereavement service. And that's so key because we know that that's a really key um, time and um, factor in terms of further suicide um, and we're looking at information sharing about staff suicide as well as system pressures continue to pl play out so we're yeah we're looking at data sharing there as well and then um, sending out sort of um, key themes and messages across the system and um, it's Lindsay Jensen who's the HR director at SWIFT who's working with me on that program is it Gemma? Can you go to the next slide? Thank you. So collaboration and networks is a really important part of all this because, as Steve said, no one organisation can do this. And so we do have a West Yorkshire wide advisory network. We've got a forum, a programme of speakers and events, some brilliant people come in next Tuesday to talk about um, pa um, changing patterns in terms of child death by suicide and also population health management approaches. Um, and what that, spoke, what that does is bring together people across the system to kind of provoke action on suicide prevention, really. But there is always a so what question at the end of information sharing, I suppose, that I'm really keen to pursue. We've also got a VCS peer support network and a lot of your voluntary sector organisations in Wakefield come to that. So that is for people on the front line, supporting people in communities who, are, who do experience suicidal ideation. And so um, I facilitate that group um, in order to kind of like uh, promote joined up work and that left shift I suppose. Um, in terms of campaigns, awareness raising and combating stigma, you'll hopefully have seen the checking campaign. So that was aimed at staff, there was tools and resources there um, and we're now sort of working on identifying those staff groups that are most at risk and doing specific work program, programs with them. The Suicide Prevention Oversight Group have agreed that that checking campaign will be rolled out to be public facing to benefit all our men in all our communities. And we're probably going to target middle aged men as we know that that's the cohort that are most likely to take their own life. We're in the really early days of kicking off um, discussions about that, but hopefully that'll be a kind of a really good public facing campaign. Um, we're producing a 
film um, around um, veterans, ex armed forces personnel and suicide risk. Um, and as I've said, we are um, investing in co-production as well. Okay, Gemma. Um, what are we doing to support people? Well, as Steve mentioned, and I've mentioned, the suicide bereavement service continues, um, but we're looking to secure sustainable funding for that and having conversations about that as well. Um, we've developed a public facing website, which I can show you in a minute at the end of the presentation, if you like, just quickly, which is a single portal for everybody across West Yorkshire, shows where they can go for help, what to do in a crisis, but it's also got resources like training and information. There's news, there's a newsletter that comes from that. So it's all about growing this kind of more suicide aware and suicide safe West Yorkshire, really. Um, we're commissioning some suicide prevention training. You've got some being delivered at place at the moment um, anyway. What we've done is we've mapped on the groups that um, are not being targeted by investment um, at place onto what we would like to do West Yorkshire wide. And we're working with Kirkley's Council to commission that, but it will be delivered right across West Yorkshire. That's a currently a live tender. And again, back to staff through the mental health hub for staff. Um, there's been some investment secured into working to deliver in specific interventions with men in our system. And we're really hoping for a partnership of VCS providers who are brilliant at engaging men to come and help us with that. Um, we've invested in some um, crisis, um, crisis support and suicide prevention training within gypsy and traveller communities. Leedsgate are delivering that and are delivering that in collaboration with um, colleagues, public health colleagues in Wakefield. And we're also producing a local protocol for employees employers about how to prepare for a suicide in their workforce and how to respond and again that's about preventing clusters or contagion. Um, quite exciting for me is that we've integrated a secondary mental health service forum to really look at um, crisis pathways at um, safe practice guidelines and at the implementation of those in our in each of the secondary mental health trusts in West Yorkshire and SWIFT are a part of that um, and we're going to have a look at some sort of complex case reviews and things like that to see how we can improve the situation for people who are um, who potentially don't get access to mental health support and what are the reasons behind that and also people um, in crisis path uh, who are experiencing mental health crisis as well um, uh, and so the kind of suicide prevention plan that I mentioned or strategy for West Yorkshire these are the kind of broad themes that we're addressing since I wrote this slide, I've got a really swanky graphic showing this. So unfortunately, you've got this one that was done by me on PowerPoint. But basically, these show the themes of the work that we've agreed to do from April and the years in which that work will kick off. Um, and hopefully this the, the full text of the strategy will be launched this week or next week. I'm, I'm really hoping uh, we're just making some final amendments there. Um, if anybody, I'll just quickly, if it's okay, if you shop, stop, if I could just share my screen, I'll ju we'll just really briefly show you this website. Um, Steve, uh, Steve and uh, Chris had asked me to um, to uh, share. Oh, actually, I'm not sure if I can because I'm accessing through, but I oh, know I can. Just tell me when you can see that. Yeah. OK, so just to briefly show, there's a, this is the website that we've produced, which is obviously public facing and there is a kind of support in your area page for Wakefield. It's taking a second to come up. So it's got all of the kind of local um, sources of support listed and places where people can can go there and we're obviously open for new content and design. It's also got some buttons at the top here for if you're bereaved by suicide, linking to all the bereavement support, or if if, if you need help early, national and local support sources of support are on there. Um, there's all of the training listed, there's, there's resources, uh, news and information, and we've got a growing network of people who um, are receiving the kind of newsletter uh, from this site, which links the suicide prevention network that I mentioned earlier on, this kind of growing movement that we're hoping to promote. I'll stop sharing that now. Steve, I don't know if you wanted to conclude, but I think that's my part done. Thank you. Uh, I, I suppose just just in, in conclusion, uh, 
it is it is very complicated uh, how people uh, get access to help, and I think that's why that that we wanted to share that website in particular because that that's a very good catch all, and that's why I'm tr we're trying to divert everything in, into that really. So it's it's coming from a, a similar place, uh, and I suppose that just in one of the comment really would be uh, we 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 come to the health and wellbeing board at least once a year, but obviously as things develop, we might want to come back more often. So more than happy to, to do that if the board would like us to return uh, on any specific other topics. Thank you. Sorry, I was on mute. I was uh, trying to find the unmute button. When we talk about suicide and, and, and you and I, Steve, have talked about this at, at length about lots and lots of things. It does beg loads of questions uh, for me. First of all, you've just shown us just the website. Are you going to develop an application because it's much easier for people to have one of these or one of these to actually have a, a, an application on there? I don't know if you're going to develop an application or not. Uh, you talked about, and I'm just particularly, you talked about a protocol and uh, Steve, you talked about the council's uh, policy and prevention strategy. I just want to say, and, and sorry, Jess, you talked about um, uh, 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 suicide in the, you know, uh, uh, of a work colleague. I wonder how many organisations on this call uh, have some sort of a protocol to actually help employees um, who might be suffering from um, somebody close to them committing suicide. And I wonder if they have, and I'm sure you have, but we need to ask the questions. If you have anyone in your organisation that somebody could actually go to, I'll leave you all to think about that one. Um, so first of all, are you uh, an application? Will there be an application, uh, Jess at all? Are you thinking? Are you actually thinking about that? And what communications are you going to get out to spread the word um, a little bit more broadly than than, than it currently is? Are we discussed an app? I'm here. I'm here. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, we've discussed an app in the past, and there are some national apps like the Hub of Hope app and others, which are which are are pretty good, really. So we've discussed whether it's about us supporting the rollout locally and the development of those that already exist, or develop our own. I think, being brutally honest, in terms of ring fence money for suicide prevention, it's it, it, it's not significant. Um, and so, um, and, and also, app, you know, around apps, are they inclusive of everybody? Potentially not, more or less inclusive of, than a website? Potentially, potentially not. These things are all really difficult. So there's a few questions. There's limited resources. Where's that best spent? Um, do we, is it the best um, strategy to bolster what's already, the apps that are already out there and make sure that they're, um, uh, marketed and um, supported within West Yorkshire or develop something new I don't know and it's definitely a question that I'll take back to the suicide prevention oversight group for for consideration but there isn't any firm plans in the pipeline to develop a lo local app at the moment um, in terms of the work colleagues and protocols that's exactly the work that I alluded to there so the first step that we're going to do is we're going to ask people within the system the health and social care system if they will share information about what's going on within their workforce um, but alongside that is an offer, I suppose, of support from the Suicide Bereavement Service, myself, and from the Mental Health Hub for employers to help develop a, pro a local protocol to prepare and also respond in the unusual event that there is a suicide among colleagues, because it is really um, critical that we support people and get the response right. right. So there is definitely a firm plan in the pipeline to develop that. Okay. Thank you. I'll bring you in a second, Joe. And I think a question to Steve on one of your um, uh, slides, you actually talked about partnership working. Um, I, and I know, and I know simply because, because I do know you and I have had conversations, but I think we need to be out there talking to the public and community groups to include those in that partnership working because very often you know they're closer uh, to anything than that than we are I mean do you have a plan to work with community groups yeah yeah certainly so um in a, a couple of ways um so and um, 
firstly, we, we really do believe a lot of the, there's a lot we can do about training and safe talk training where it's general awareness uh, uh, is, is and the assist training uh, is is really good quality training, which is uh, we've invested in locally. So we have uh, trainers that can go out and train people without having to bring people in from, from outside. Uh, when we first offered that, we found professionals took it up almost immediately and we were overwhelmed by professionals um, accessing the training. So we're trying to ring fence that for community groups now and trying to, to work uh, on a, a more local level to get communities uh, engaged. And it, and it can be it can be anybody. Uh, and we really do want to try and think laterally about who do people talk to uh, and and when and can we get them some training? And you know we've had ideas of recovery drivers, uh, we've had ideas of hairdressers, uh, and just having uh, some we, we really want to push that that training down away from professionals into into communities. Um, uh, so so that yeah, so training is a a big part of that uh, in many ways. Uh, uh, as yeah, I think that's probably the the, the main point point on on uh, on communities because we do want to get that that community uh, suicide aware communities uh, uh, and and do that as as much as possible. Thanks, Stephen. I know that and and I welcome as an elected member uh, that represents a, a ward that the the offer that has been made uh, by public health to actually. Uh, come out into our communities and, and 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 do safe talk with up to 30 people uh, within the ward. Now, really, really, as an elected member, uh, appreciate that. Sean, you were first with your hand up. I think it was your chair first. No, okay. it, it goes in order, apparently. Uh, Sean, right. yeah, leave your hand Okay. Um, as, as Steve's... Um, on a number of occasions attended the Wakefield Mental Health Alliance and we've had discussions about how we coordinate and support um, suicide prevention and post prevention um, work and um, it, it's high on our agenda as a Wakefield Mental Health Alliance this issue and one, one thing that struck me Steve following Steve, Steve was at a meeting recently with um, local MPs, I don't know whether you were there Joe and Yvette Cooper was asking about yeah resources available for suicide prevention in the district and when when I saw the collation Steve of the mm. the um, scope of resource available whether that be in the culture and community sector rugby clubs um, there's an awful lot of activity happening in community settings as well as um, mm. statutory agencies um, and I think the, the website is, is a really good way of um, ensuring that's collated in a, in a coherent way. But I just wonder whether we also need to ask, and we're, we're doing some engagement with um, communities, hopefully by the Alliance over the course of the next year, whether we ask people as well, where best they would like to can access uh, information. Because it's, it, we shouldn't assume that websites, apps, et cetera, are um, the most appropriate. And we, we need to ask communities themselves or people in communities where best they, they would if, if they had to access such, such information where best they could do that. Because I do believe there's a significant amount of support available that's perhaps not being fully utilised at the moment in the district. Yeah, I'd, I'd very much support that, that's Sean. And, and, and the, the conversation we had with the, with the Vet Keeper's Office was really interesting because it's, we, we see the data uh, and we see, and we, and we sometimes, but actually the data is slow and clunky, um, as data always is. Uh, and not often what we hear, we, we hear rumours or we, we, somebody comes and tells us that there's been a, a, a possible suicide. And, it, and it's that kind of information that's really vital. Um, so that, that's working with those uh, very grassroots organisations where, um, where they, they know something's happening. Uh, and that's what we can then go and, and try and uh, support them to do to do work that will prevent suicides but i think one thing we mustn't forget as well is to support the people who do that work uh, so we so we've worked with lots of community organizations when we've had clusters and they've been absolutely in, incredible uh, and organized uh, events and organized uh, support uh, with with professional partners but it's a big burden for for communities to to bear as well so we, we need to support them and make sure they've got access to to support which we try to do through samaritans which is uh which are you know, an absolute brilliant organisation. 
Uh, thank you. I've got several people want to speak. So, Joe, I've got you next. Yeah, there was two points. Um, one was um, about sort of organisations supporting employees, um, are both to recognise and then support them if unfortunately they find themselves in that situation. And Maureen, there's a really good national training tool that takes literally five or ten minutes. It's online and um, West Yorkshire encouraged all employees across the partnership, regardless of the organisation they belong to, to engage in that training tool. And we can make that available after this meeting, but I would, I've done it myself. It's really helpful um, and it could make a difference to how you um, uh, recognise the signs, but also support people going through it. So I think that's something that we could do. And Jess, you'll probably be familiar with that that training tool so uh, we can make that available and um, I think the other thing about investment is every year we have a mental health investment which is new growth in mental health resource of which we as a district can determine how we invest in that and Sean I think that probably this area around suicide and how we bring that into our uh, priorities for the partnership may be something that we want to consider um, in the future so so there is opportunities to um, to invest in these areas that um, are longing, I think, for some intervention in the future. So let's 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 see what we can do for next year. Uh, that's lovely and really useful, Joe. And I, I I know that Jess has put um, into the into the chat the link, but I think it's an absolutely fantastic. I have actually seen uh, what you're talking about, but I think it would be very worthwhile for us to, uh, as a health and wellbeing board, to send it to send it round in our organisations, uh, and that gives people the choice and the opportunity. Uh, Maddie, you're next. Thank you. Um, just really, oh, sorry. Just um, to say um, that, did you say, Jess, that there would be support for employers to have that policy, have those sort of procedures in place. And I guess just a plea to support organisations to, to make it something real. Um, because from, from different experiences, whether you're a family member, an employer or a professional, I think you have the same person would have different responses. It's just, it's very complicated, isn't it? And so I guess it's just giving people confidence. And it goes back to Steve, what you said, how, you know, in, in, in nearly all cases, um, death by suicide is a shock. So people didn't necessarily see it coming and couldn't necessarily prepare and, um, you know, perhaps didn't have the conversations that, that might have helped. So I guess I'm, I'm not really sure what my question is, and I'm it's quite an emotive uh, subject, isn't it? But I just yeah, make it real. I guess is the the plea. Thank you very can much. I, uh, sorry, I'm just going to just come back on that if that's, if oh, that's yes, okay. Yes, sorry. Yeah. yeah, no. So just to say, I totally get it, Maddie. And what we've got we've got a brilliant protocol I think that's really thorough that we can use in West Yorkshire. But what I'm doing is thankfully I've got some colleagues within the system. Who have, who have um, line managed individuals or, or managed teams where a death by suicide has happened and has been a shock and different members of the team have reacted in different ways. And so I'm currently going through a process of having a conversation with four or five people about what that felt like in order to then try and come up with the best solution. And then it's about, um, it's about employers pre preparing and, and realizing that, that, that this may happen to them and then how are they organisationally going to respond and protect their staff uh, and support their staff within that so I totally hear you I get what you're saying and it's a small bit of the work that we're doing but it's an important bit I think so thank you. Okay the uh, next speaker is uh, are the next questions from you Lee. Thanks Maureen. Um, it's good to see such a, a vital piece of work going across both uh, West Yorkshire and obviously Wakefield uh, we're seeing a significant impact in terms of our incident attendance around this area, at attending um, attempted suicides and um, and suicides themselves. Um, and it's it's just an interesting point. And I apologise out to my IT issues during that, so you may have already covered this. Um, so I've noticed on your slide, Jess, that you're, you're working in partnership with ourselves and, and linking in. Um, 
who you're dealing with and, and what information are you, are you gathering in terms of uh, is, it, is it where we're attending incidents, the numbers, the demographics, etc. I just missed that that part of your presentation. Yeah, so it's your colleague Naomi Hurst, who I think is the safeguard and leader in Leeds. Yeah. Are you familiar yeah. with her? So that's the individual that we've linked with, and she assured me that she can collect information about the whole of the West Yorkshire Fire and Rescue Service. And yes, okay. we have asked for information about um, uh, attempt suicide call outs that involve the Fire and Rescue Service yeah. and all the demographic data that, uh, that will feed into our real time surveillance group, hopefully, at some point in. We're looking at the spring to get the system up and running because obviously it's quite um we need to get a lot of agreement in terms of information sharing and, and what that looks like and who that's to and then the view is the, the hope is that with this plus the information we get from police plus information that we're hopefully going to get from yaz as well we're then able to send out um Tre sort of trend information potentially or, or other types of information across the system to enable that prevention work to happen in a kind of safe and secure way that everybody knows what's going on in our communities and we can have this collective call I suppose to respond what that looks like yet in detail I'm not sure like I said Steve's chairing some of that work and working with me really closely so we're, we're kind of going through a bit of a process with that but yeah it's, it's your colleague Naomi Hurst and there's um somebody I spoke to on a call in Bradford as well the other day and the fire officer yeah, Gemma. yeah 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 that's it Okay, but yeah, that that's great. You've, you've answered my question there, and, and obviously we get a lot of that local intelligence and and, and what local forums we can feed into. If you're gathering the information across West Yorkshire, great, but we get a lot of information, particularly around your Chantry Bridge, the M1, where there's there's local pre preventative measures that potentially could be put in place, and it's where do we, where can we feed that that information and and and, and get an action at the end of it. Okay, thank you. I'm sure there's a discussion to be had between the fire service and uh, and yourself, Jess. Um, Ruth, you did have your hand up, but you put it down, and I didn't want to miss you. I did. Sorry, I only put it down because my internet connection was unstable. I thought I was going to get kicked out. Um, no, it's just when Steve was talking about p places where we might be able to provide mm. training, talking about, you know, say, as, as an example, Steve used, was hairdressers. Mm. I was just thinking, is there an opportunity at risk of turning bite-sized chunks into an elephant to offer a training on a range of things so mm. there are a number of people like that like the councillors mps officers mm. pub landlords a clergy where people might disclose on a range of issues and i was just thinking we're running at the moment that ask angela campaign mm. which is about domestic mm. violence yeah. could we you know through various associations offer a package of training that covers a range of things that together that was all I was thinking right I think Steve you'd no need to put your hand up I was going to come back to you anyway um but uh, but yeah I mean it's 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 um it's very good that you've mentioned the clergy we're going to do one with the clergy uh, quite soon I think aren't we Steve so anyway if you want to come in and, and answer that question and wind up and then I, I, I'll I'll just put some thoughts uh for the minutes no I think that that's a great a great suggestion and it's putting agendas together that make it better doesn't it so it's uh, and i think that that's that that's a great idea i think uh, from ruth uh what what i did want to come back on was we talk about stones hitting ponds and creating ripples but unlike stones hitting ponds the problem with suicide is is it you may feel like you've moved past it and then a month later three months later a year later uh, then then it resurfaces and the help is still is still available so i think that that's worth worth saying and and probably should have said at, at, at the outset that it is an emotive subject, and, and it is worth just acknowledging that 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 you know we, we talk about lots of different issues in our forums, but actually suicide is one that really does hit home with people, uh, and and we've all been. I'm guessing there's people in the room who've been uh, affected, and, and don't think that just because we're professionals that we are, are immune to to the effects of it. So if if anybody's needing help, then please do reach out. Yeah, I think, um, and I, I think I will wind up. Uh, thank you for the presentation, uh, Steve and Jess. But just to wind up, um, Joe, the online tool uh, to employees, I think fantastic. We need to actually uh, do that, and I think organisations need to give the opportunity to their employees actually to do that as well. 
uh, I'm hearing from Maddie uh, about a protocol from Jess, maybe sharing a protocol so that maybe out to the voluntary sector, because let's face it, you know, the two years that we've just gone through, people are, are using food banks, using our community facilities, help at the hubs, etc. We need to ensure that those people uh, are, are, are fully informed and involved uh, on what, what to look for. So I think that's, that's fantastic. Ruth places uh, to provide the training absolutely you know let's be diverse let's let's you know find the places let's go into places we wouldn't normally uh, go into but i think what we have to say and and and, and anna this is to you there's going to be there's a cost to all this um we can't provide training for nothing um but uh, i'm i'm sure we can help where we can uh, and, and be as uh, we can offer at reduced prices. So if anybody does want any training from any of the team on Safe Talk or Assist, then I know that uh, Anna's team will help, uh, and, and particularly Steve, who I, I've always found very helpful uh, on this subject. So thank you very much, Steve. Thank you, Jess. We look forward to you getting now inundated with requests. Uh, for help and and and, and stuff um and we look forward to uh, uh you coming back in a year's time and telling us that everything's got better uh, and we keep us fingers crossed for that so uh thank you very much you're more than welcome to stay but i know there are constraints on your time uh, and we are coming to the last item on the agenda which is um the citizens experience feedback is gary jevons with us I can't see him on the list. He hasn't joined, Chair. Well, we've got, well, well, that's lovely, quarter past three. Um, we have, um, we do have a, a, a report from Gary, I know because I've read it, uh, an update report on, on what they've been doing in, in engaging with the public and, and so on and so forth. And I think the uh, recommendation at the end of it is to continue uh, to, uh, uh, engage um so I'm, I'm i'm not quite sure what do you know i'm lost for words and that's not like me lost for words but um if anybody's any questions on this report then you know please submit them to catherine and she'll get them uh, responded to uh, for you uh, does anybody want to say anything uh, around um the 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 feedback here No. OK, thank you. Uh, and the last three items and wow, I've propped my door open with two of them uh, is the uh, connecting care executive uh, notes and the overview and scrutiny minutes for the 11th of November and the 9th of December. Um, they're there for information. There's some really good stuff, actually, in the uh, in the overview and scrutiny. I, I do think they, they do a good job in challenging. Sometimes they're over enthusiastic with their challenge. But uh, I think it is something that we uh, that we do actually need to ensure that we move forward in the right way. So uh, has anybody any other business? I can't see everybody, but nobody has got a hand up, she says, whizzing back. Uh, if not, then the last thing I want to say is the uh, next meeting is the 24th of March, at half past one, I think it will be face to face. Anna, it's looking as though, we, nod your head, it's looking as though we're gonna be face to face in the council chamber for that one. Thank you, Anna. Um, and with that, I will, stay, I will just say, stay safe. Uh, for me, it's wear a mask and continue to wear a mask. Once you've had it, you don't want to get it again. Um, and we'll see what the government, what exciting news the government comes out with next once they've had a party at the back of 10 Downing Street. Oh, dear, Maureen, stop saying that. So thank you very much. Thank you for your attendance. And I'll see you all soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.